Hello, everybody. This is Elisa Baum. I am Precona's Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I want to conduct a little bit of housekeeping. If you can hear me, please let me know by raising your hand in the uh, GoToWebinar control panel. And just want to make sure you, everyone can hear me. Okay, great. I see hands. Thank you very much. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we will take time to answer as many questions as possible, and those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog entry on Percona's MySQL performance blog. In addition, I'll make sure that everybody gets a recording of this webinar and copies of the slides within 48 hours. I'd like to thank you today for attending today's webinar, MySQL and OpenStack Deep Dive. It's being jointly presented by Percona Principal Architect Peter Burroughs and Marantis Principal Technical Ar Architect Jay Pipes. And Jay, I believe you'll be starting, so let me turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Elisa. Uh, so welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Jay Pipes. Uh, like Elisa said, I'm a principal technical architect at Marantis. I actually used to be uh, involved quite heavily in the MySQL community. And uh, now I, I work predominantly in the OpenStack community. But there's uh, quite a few areas uh, where the two communities overlap, um, particularly in the operator and deployer sphere. So uh, I actually met Peter Boros from Pacona last um, May uh, at, in the Atlanta OpenStack uh, Design Summit. And um, I was quite impressed with uh, Peter's uh, knowledge and understanding of, of MySQL Galera and Pacona ExtraDB Extra cluster. And uh, the two of us kind of hit it off and decided that we'd, we'd like to do some uh, performance and uh, uh, benchmarking type stuff uh, involving MySQL and OpenStack. So we developed for the, the last design summit in Paris for, for OpenStack a, a session called MySQL and OpenStack Deep Dive, which is what we're going to present today. So uh, could we go to the first slide there? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the setup that we used to test and identify areas where OpenStack uh, is not particularly efficient or effective in using MySQL Galera cluster. Um, we're, we're predominantly focused in these slides in isolating the database performance within OpenStack. So um, what you're not going to see is any discussion of, say, you know, network I/O or, or storage, um, storage systems or uh, virtual machine boot times or anything like that. Because what our focus was is trying to figure out what are the bottlenecks from the the database layer, uh, not any of the other layers. So while those layers are very interesting, we just focused on trying to isolate as much as we could. The, uh, the database API layer uh, in the various OpenStack services. So um, at the end of this set of slides, you'll have a set of conclusions that, that we make um, that will show you, uh, among other things, uh, <laughs> what it is about the, the database layers in the various OpenStack services that does need some attention and some things that you can do to um, uh, to keep an eye on uh, in future releases of, of OpenStack. So, uh, the next slide, please. So, like I said, our our ideas and our objectives here were to identify the the bottlenecks specifically at the database layer, and we're trying to understand for a typical request that goes into uh, the Nova and Neutron OpenStack services. Nova is the compute service inside of OpenStack, so it's responsible for spinning up a virtual machine and uh, you know, taking various actions against that virtual machine, rebooting it, that kind of thing. Uh, and Neutron, uh, which is the networking service. So we're trying to understand specifically for, for a typical request to, say, launch a VM with uh, a network interface card, a virtual NIC uh, assigned to that VM, what are the database queries that are executed for that typical uh, typical request, whether it's uh, a creation 
of a of a of a VM or a, a, a tearing down a, a, a termination of the VM, and we want to understand specifically what the database queries that are executed for each of those are. So, next slide, please. Thanks. So what uh, Peter and I did was um, we used um, Amazon Web Service, a virtual private cloud, a set of instances running in that VPC, uh, all running OpenStack. So this probably sounds really weird to people <laughs> that, we're, uh, that we're running OpenStack inside of an AWS uh, virtual private cloud. Um, but again, the idea of this is to isolate a very specific um, failure domain and uh, code path. So we're not particularly interested in the raw performance of something. What we're trying to do is identify the specific database bottlenecks, right? So having virtualization platform within a virtualization platform is, is really not a problem for us. So we created a set of Ansible playbooks um, that are used to set up the what we call an under and an over cloud, the under cloud being the infrastructure services like MySQL and RabbitMQ and those kind of things, uh, along with some of the OpenStack services that, that uh, serve tenant requests, and then an overcloud, which is the set of VMs that are running on top of um, uh, hypervisor, hypervisors within that cloud environment. And I'll give you the link to the, to the uh, Ansible playbooks there uh, for reference. Uh, we used unmodified OpenStack ISAS packages from Ubuntu Cloud Archive, and we use unmodified uh, Percona packages for ExtraDB cluster. And this is very important because we didn't want to tweak or really modify anything to do with the source code for either Percona or or any of the OpenStack packages. And the reason is we wanted to, again, isolate just the database layer within OpenStack and not not make any sort of uh, uh, tweaks to anything to try and uh, sway the benchmark results uh, in, in any way, way, shape, or form. So next slide. Um, so the challenges that we faced in trying to deploy this environment are a little different than most operators or deployers would face when trying to uh, set up an OpenStack production environment, right? So we're not particularly concerned about actually starting a VM, right? Uh, we're also not concerned about whether the, the, the VM has uh, working networking between, between VMs because we're, we're not interested in testing, say, network I.O. performance or bandwidth between VMs. We're actually just, just interested in the database queries. Um, so some of the things that we ran into that you normally wouldn't run into uh, at, the, at the first time uh, that you set up a production deployment of OpenStack are things that we actually ran into, which is needing to have the controller nodes, which are the nodes that run the API services, uh, performing uh, as, as quickly as possible in order to basically flood them with, with database requests. So I'll let uh, Peter take it from here to describe a little more in detail about our setup. Hello, everybody. I'm Peter Boros, Principal Architect uh, at Percona. So our first setup uh, had seven AWS instances, one controller node, one uh, compute worker, one network node, three nodes uh, as per extra DB cluster nodes, and one node ra running Raleigh, uh, which is the benchmarking tool of, of our choice, and I think the uh, best or probably the only available benchmarking tool uh, for benchmarking OpenStack Cloud. And we did use C3.8x large instances, which are quite beefy machines. They have 24 cores, uh, 60 gigs of memory, and SSD ephemeral drives. We wanted to test on uh, such powerful hardware because, uh, first, because we can, why? Uh, but second, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to see the bottlenecks. For example, a bottleneck can be only a single core utilized. Uh, we didn't want uh, I.O. particularly to, uh, to be the bottleneck and uh, things like that. And as a first at the first glance with this first setup, here are the database issues discovered. And this is not a title slide. So it was um, 
such light load on, on the database that if I would give you a textbook with the data, you would be able to cope with the queries most likely. So then what happened? We, we ran into a couple of other bottlenecks, which uh, are most, uh, mostly in connection with the unusual nature of our setup. For example, the, the first thing was that Neutron server packed the single CPU core. And this is because the default number of workers of Neutron Server in Icehouse is one. So we set the API workers to the number of CPU cores uh, times two and set the RPC workers to the number of CPU cores. After rerunning the benchmark, the database was, uh, was more loaded, but then Keystone had a, a similar issue that it was a single process daemon and Keystone does uh, cryptographical stuff which is pretty much CPU intensive meaning that uh, you know it uh, it packed a, a whole CPU core so in order to avoid that we run it as a VSGI application within Apache that way we could use multiple processes and we ran into the bug uh, uh, mentioned on the slide. The workload there just did work, so uh, so after this um, Keystone w was multi-process as well. The next thing we noticed is that the message queue is taking up significant uh, resources, the RabbitMQ, after these modifications and we saw that the network node is pretty idle and uh, Neutron's DHCP agent needs queue access anyway, so we put the queue uh, on the network node to free up some resources on the controller node. So for the final setup we had, we had, had 16 AWS instances, uh, one controller node, we definitely want more of these in the future, but uh, where we got with this benchmarking is that we were able to uh, saturate a single controller node. We are working on, um, you know, the ability to have multiple controller nodes. We are running in, uh, into some uh, uh, some configuration issues, which prevents us from uh, from having that. We had uh, ten compute worker nodes, one network and queue node, three database nodes, uh, three extra DB cluster nodes, and one node for benchmarking. The Everything was C3.8x large, except the compute worker nodes, which were C3.large. And we needed compute worker nodes because uh, otherwise, if we had one, the single compute worker node would be a single row at some level uh, in the database, and we wanted to, you know, avoid contention on, on that single row. The actual hardware of the compute worker node doesn't really matter. It doesn't uh, do anything significant because so, we have used. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, I just wanted to add in here that um, mm -hmm. there's a reason that we could use just uh, such a small um, Amazon Web Services instance type, the C3 large with only two cores, and that that really is because the Nova compute worker, which is the uh, daemon that takes commands from the message queue to spawn an instance, uh, reboot, and that kind of thing. Uh, that's single threaded. So there's really nothing, and since, again, we weren't actually launching VMs uh, in, in this, uh, we, we didn't need any space and, and there would be no benefit at all to having more cores uh, because, again, it was single threaded on the Nova compute side. No, oh, okay. So that's the that's the final setup, and um, we used uh, Nova's uh, uh, fake driver for virtualization. So uh, with with the fake driver, if you do Nova boot, Nova doesn't actually start a VM, but uh, so you will see it running and everything happens, which. Uh, which would happen otherwise, just if you do uh, VSH list on the compute node, it will be empty because the, there, is no, uh, there is no actual hypervisor behind it. It's a, 
it's a driver which li uh, lies that the hypervisor level is always successful and super fast. It's, it's uh, the black hole storage engine for Nova. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So again, we use them compute modes, nodes for the simulating uh, more realistic compute nodes table updates. I don't know, Jay, you probably have more realistic experience on this than me that uh, what's the typical number of compute nodes people have probably in the hundreds range or well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the gamut of, of sizes of OpenStack kind of run, uh, runs all over the place. So uh, I would say that most uh, small deployments are 10 nodes and less, maybe 20 nodes and less. Medium-sized deployments are 20 to 50 nodes, and, um, you know, it goes up from there. I think the long largest installation of OpenStack has about 15,000 compute nodes right now, um, but there are, there are several with, with over 1,000 uh, compute nodes, and these are, you know, compute nodes typically with 256 to 512 gig of RAM um, and lots of disk for, for local storage and, and lots of NICs, <laughs> so yeah, lots of computing power. Yeah, so not exactly our fake setup. Uh, we try to set the quota driver to uh, quota DB driver, and uh, so sorry, we set the quota driver to quota DB driver, but we try to set it to a no op driver as well. Uh, we try to set it to DB driver and set quotas to minus one, and we try to set the quotas uh, arbitrarily high. Uh, like um, 100,000 CPU cores, but it really didn't matter, which was uh, kind of a surprise to us because, uh, you know, knowing how quota management works, we expected that to be the bot to be one of the bottlenecks, but it didn't actually uh, popped up. And we used UID tokens with the Keystone. We tried PKI but kept running into issues with multiple controllers. So this is most likely uh, something which we will solve until spring. And UID tokens hammered the Keystone DB more anyway, and we wanted to generate some database load. So, and it's also it's also the the most realistic and. Uh, it's the most realistic option used in production deployments, actually. There are many more deployments of OpenStack using UUID tokens um, than uh, public key infrastructure tokens. So. Okay, so what we tested. So we used Raleigh. And after installing Raleigh, the playbooks uh, install Raleigh for you. You can check if it works and if it sees your cloud with Raleigh deployment check. And if you see such an output, then, then it works. And a benchmark uh, looks like the following. Okay, so this is the boot and delete server scenario where we will boot and delete servers. Uh, we will boot m1.tiny servers with Cirrus image. Please note that the image doesn't actually matter here because we won't start the VM. It only matters at the level that it has to exist in, in Glance. So if it doesn't exist in Glance, you won't be able to run this uh, run this benchmark. But the play looks at Yeah, also what type of playbooks didn't need it, so that may uh, that may seem weird to you know to people with the production configurations. Uh, you have to specify the Neutron network ID, and this network in Neutron has to be shared. Um, for the benchmark tenants, because Raleigh will create uh, tenants, and 
uh, the, those tenants will actually start the VMs. And we see here um, in this example we are creating a thousand VMs and destroying them with a concurrency of 24 so we are creating and destroying 24 at the same time and we are creating uh, 50 tenants and 10 users per tenant so in Raleigh's pre-processing step those tenants and users are, uh, are created and they are used uh, during the benchmarks uh, scenario. Also uh, we set the quotas of uh, NOVA and Neutron to minus one so we don't run into, uh, into quota issues and for example again with such a let's say benchmarking cloud you can easily uh, you can easily hit, for example, the memory limitation because Nova still, uh, Nova still uh, counts uh, memory and does the accounting for memory. But again, because we are using fake driver, there is no real memory allocation at the hypervisor level. So this is actually a, a good thing to do. This is how we started the tasks. The, the task so started like this and you can list it with Raleigh task list and you can generate uh, HTML reports from the task uh, from the tasks which are uh, quite nice let me navigate to to the browser so I I will share another window in a Jiffy is that visible now, the Raleigh output? Yes, I think so, yeah. Okay. So, whoops. Is it still visible? Yes, looks good. Okay. So, what we did we measured with, so the first benchmark we ran, uh, we then was one controller node connecting to only one of the database cluster nodes, uh, booting 10,000 uh, VMs and after that uh, booting and deleting 5,000 VMs. So, and after so one benchmark run will start 10,000 VMs, you know, to have some static load on the cloud and then do a boot and delete of, of 5,000 with those 10,000 left running. And we did this uh, with two scenarios. The first one, uh, the first one is um, connecting to only one database. We actually uh, have two backends configured in HA proxy and the second scenario is connecting to all three Galera nodes. So, and this is a Raleigh HTML output. So the whole thing uh, took a total. Uh, okay, there is no total. So the minimum, so the fastest uh, VM creation was 10 seconds. The slowest was 30, and the uh, 90 percentile was uh, 20 seconds, so it, it was fairly, you, know, you can see from the graph that the performance is fairly consistent and every request uh, succeeded, so we created the 10,000 VMs. While we were connecting to three database nodes, we had a few errors, 24 errors, so not, uh, not every uh, not every instance was created. And what we can see is that connecting to more database nodes uh, yields, uh, so the minimum time needed was somewhat lower, but the, and the average time was uh, some, yeah, it's, uh, I would say it's around the same. And the maximum time is uh, like significantly uh, significantly more. So, there, in this case, there was really, 
I, I would say there was no benefit from uh, connecting to all the three nodes, but uh, in Galera, if you connect to all the three nodes, it uh, because each node has to receive the whole set of data, right? Through so, uh, write set replication, what you win with this is you can uh, spread the SQL parsing overhead across nodes in exchange for potential uh, log conflicts, which we will talk about later. And this is similar output for boot and delete. So this is a this operation takes you know more time, and here we we have plenty of errors even co connecting to one database and here is the three database scenario with three databases it's uh, this is significantly faster and uh, again for a with a slightly higher error we can see a slightly higher error rate so oh, okay and one of the, one of the takeaways of this is that um, we we did find that when spreading the the read and write load across all three Galera cluster nodes, um, it like like Peter just showed, it did have a significant uh, impact, a positive impact on the total performance for a heavy read write workload. So the 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 boot server scenario is different from the boot and delete server scenario in that there are many more update and delete uh, SQL queries being executed in the latter. And that's where we found actually a, a benefit to uh, spreading the write load across all of the Galera clusters. I will say, however, yeah. that uh, it is it is a very common practice in um, in OpenStack deployments to have only a single uh, Galera cluster node being uh, read or written to at any given time. Um, personally, when when uh, we deployed OpenStack at AT and T, we uh, had multi multi writer. Galera cluster nodes for all of our databases and did not really see any issues whatsoever. Um, it was it was very stable. However, due to various benchmarking and QA tests that can reproduce conflict issues in Galera, which we'll we'll show in a little bit, um, many people think that having multi writers uh, or rather directing writes to multiple Galera cluster nodes uh, is is not supported or produces a lot of failures, and uh, you really do have to go out of your way to uh, to produce uh, conflicts. Meaning the the load on the database needs to be fairly extreme and not something that you'd see necessarily in in a production environment. So just wanted to note. Okay. Also. Uh yeah, so let's talk a bit about uh, XMDB cluster. Uh, this won't be long, right? We have plenty of webinars on uh, how XMDB cluster works and uh, the specifics of it. I uh, would just like to give a gist of it to you know to if if somebody didn't watch uh, any of them, then the the relevant part is covered here. So the cluster can be seen as a meeting. The meeting table there has the cluster UUID and the little blue people are the cluster nodes. When somebody leaves the meeting, the cluster is still up. The meeting is there. So somebody can leave and then rejoin the meeting. And the meeting can go on. People can leave. But when the last nodes leave, there will be no meeting. The table doesn't have a cluster UUID. And when a new node comes in, a new meeting is started, and all the nodes will uh, will join to will join to that node. I would like to talk a bit about how uh, replication works, and this is important because uh, because we will see that with some OpenStack workloads. Uh, this uh, this is an issue. I wouldn't say it's um, so. It's 
honestly, I think it's a lot more scary than than the actual issue it causes. So when whenever uh, the the uh, the point is that the replication happens at commit time. So if the statement has auto commit, it will the other nodes will get it when the first node could commit it. And uh, there is a there is a certification uh, process which makes sure uh, that there is a uh, which makes sure that the given write set is applicable to the databases um, and all these mechanics we discussed in other webinars which I you know which I won't cover here the bottom line is that if we have a transaction until commit no replication is involved so what is important here is that if a transaction has select for update that only logs the records on the originating node of the given query. So people are running into deadlock issues with Galera and those deadlock issues are really replication conflicts, meaning that uh, a record is logged on a, on a node and another node can happily write to it but the cluster has to do a brute force support because this node won't be able to uh, won't be able to apply it because the lock uh, is held by select for update so uh, as expected the the lock kind of works just uh, just people uh, people are not expecting that lock errors there so it's uh, between between the nodes, it's not like regular in ODB where you log, where you have records lock right inside the transaction, which we call pessimistic locking. But between the nodes, it's optimistic locking. That um, we assume that there will be no lock conflicts, and if there will be, the certification uh, certification mechanism will uh, will do conflict resolution there. Okay. Um, so okay, I think we already talked about this. Yes, I already showed the benchmarks. And all tenants in uh, we already discussed this as well. That all tenants in Raleigh are using the same shared network and feature in uh, Raleigh coming soon that allows this limitation to be lifted. Uh, we examined the query load on MySQL because um, lots of people ask us if uh, not necessarily related to uh, related to OpenStack, but is it safe to migrate my stuff to Galera? Will it work there? So we took uh, the OpenStack workload and performed a series of PT query digest analysis. So this is practically, PT query digest is practically a slow log aggregator and you can aggregate based on uh, various stuff. This is how a slow query log event uh, looks like in Percona server. This is log slow verbosity full. So if you are not using Percona server, you won't have uh, many things from this. Uh, including the NoDB statistics, which we will use uh, to analyze if our workload is uh, prone to lock conflict or not, uh, certification errors or not. And just to show that this is uh, that it's really just a slow log parser, uh, here I parsed the slow log event and dumped it to JSON, abusing its uh, the tools modularity uh, in Perl. Okay, so with PT Query Digest, we are um, getting the transactions with the most rows affected. In this file, Digest TRX rows affected. The transactions with the highest statement count. The most rows affected is interesting because large transactions are not playing well with Galera's parallel application. And the reason for that is 
that um, because of the certification mechanism, uh, nodes can apply the events in, uh, in its queue in parallel. But let's say if it has 10 events in its queue, 9 of them takes 100 milliseconds and the 10th takes 10 seconds, then it blocks the replication uh, flow for, uh, for 10 seconds for the, for the longest transaction because uh, at certification time the transactions are only checked um, against other transactions in the queue, not against transactions that are being applied right now. Okay, we check uh, transactions with the highest statement count, uh, the largest statements by rows affected. Again, this is interesting because of locking, right? So, if, for example, if this is a write, it, uh, it locks uh, lots of records or a select for update. Queries that write the most and queries that are generating the most uh, row lock weight because in the extended slow lock format in extra DB cluster we have uh, InnoDB record lock weight recorded, we can uh, just go ahead and, uh, and create a digest based on that. And one moment I will show another window now, show you some digests. Okay. Do you see my text editor? Yep. So these are the logs for the one controller, one database, and ten, uh, and with 10k uh, boot server. And here, if we look at the profile, commit takes the uh, takes the most significant amount of time. Then uh, port allocation. In, uh, I think this is the in neutron. the neutron database. So see, the database is neutron. Is the second with with 10 percent of the workload. And remember this because this will this is going to be interesting. So this is uh, just the the way you use PT Query Digest regularly. That um, you know, find out what uh, what took the most amount of time. And for the neutron query, it's interesting that we see full join 100% yes and full scan 100% yes. And this is the actual query. Does it fit the screen? E Not really. And trying. Okay. Yes, it does. So this is the. Yes. Uh, it, it, this is yeah. Basically, basically, the reason um, that this is such a horrible query in uh, the Ice House version of of Neutron is that the uh, the join conditions from ML2 port bindings table to the other tables uh, are not uh, all over indexed field and therefore it triggers a, uh, a, a table scan and full join. So. Okay, so if we check the 5k boot and delete server afterwards, we can see that this query uh, popped up to the, to the top, taking uh, like almost 50% of the database time. So, you know, examining uh, also examining the work database workload like this in isolation uh, will allow us to uh, identify database level uh, level bottlenecks like this. So the good news is that this is a this is a relatively easy fix. The yeah the the next thing we can check is record block weights. So uh, this is important in the case of, uh, of one node. And why it's important is 
that record lock weights can uh, potentially be converted to deadlock errors, to, to uh, replication conflicts in extra DB cluster. So here we don't order by uh, time spent overall, but rather time spent in record lock weights. And the time spent in, uh, and we can see that the first query is uh, such a select for update uh, that we talked about earlier. Right, the second query, again, it's a select for update on quota usages. Uh, so because of this, we thought that uh, quota usage, uh, quota usage might be a, a bottleneck we run into. We didn't run it, uh, run into it yet, but it doesn't mean that we won't. The next is an insert. Uh, the insert can be here because it can be blocked on the select for updates uh, record locks because uh, the select for update if it locks a range, uh, it can lock the uh, the subsumum record as well, which will prevent the insert from happening. Next is a select for update as well. So you see, you see the point. Okay. Uh, transactions with the most rows affected large uh, transactions. This is interesting because in the profile of this digest, uh, you will only see uh, InnoDB transaction IDs, right? So, and we can see that uh, we had a huge transaction here. And I can tell you that that was because I uh, didn't uh, I didn't uh, reset the slow log after uh, the the DB sync operation. So the single transaction of creating the table with the initial data is is actually this transaction. But for the rest, I would say OpenStack workload is very very well behaving in terms of uh, in terms of uniformity in uh, in transaction size. Also for this, uh, I would like to show you a technique, which is this: how can you how can you get an InnoDB transaction run from the slow log? So you can grab for the InnoDB transaction ID with dash b5 and dash a8, and you will see the slow logs associated with the whole transaction run and I cut this for Gruity but if you also filter out the uh, the comments and the set comments you can see only the SQL of the big transactions and here you can see that this is done by DB sync when uh, so it allocates every GRE, uh, GRE tunnel ID in Neutron. Okay. So, okay. And looks like I showed the Raleigh output reports early because I thought it, uh, it, it was feasible there and I thought otherwise when I was making the slides or when we were making the slides. Yeah, so I showed, uh, showed these in the meantime instead. Last, uh, we would like to share some uh, takeaways. The first takeaway is that database is by far not the bottleneck. So we were managed to um, to saturate the 24 cores of the controller node while only like 1.5 uh, core of the database was saturated. So many people uh, came to me at the summit asking about scalability options, about automatic sharding options on, uh, on MySQL because they wanted to scale MySQL um, behind an OpenStack cloud, I would say that 
on the metadata database level that bottleneck is, is quite far away even in the even in the current state. Uh, there are known database hotspots and we would like to you know, continue this kind of testing and hopefully set, uh, get a saturated database for the next, uh, for the next OpenStack Summit and for, for the OpenStack Live conference in what we will have in Santa Clara. But, so if we calculate it, we, in the current setup, we need like 20 controller nodes to do that. Which we'll, we'll figure that out. <laughs> Yes. Over, the, over the next few months, um, yeah. Uh, just to back up, what 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 Peter's saying is, um, especially once you um, take a look at real production VMs being spun up and spun down, um, the database really is is not the bottleneck. There are certainly some areas where we can improve on the database performance, and there's definitely areas uh, inside of Nova, Neutron, and Cinder where we can uh, remove any use of the select for update uh, statements and, and use different uh, strategies for uh, quota usage and, and, and IP allocation queries. Um, but for the most part, anyone running an OpenStack production cloud, uh, if you're running into database bottlenecks, um, it, it likely is uh, something to do with a, a misconfiguration uh, of, of one of the services and, um, and it's not really the, the database that is the, the bottleneck. So um, I personally am, am very open to receive uh, comments and, and, and feedback via, via email. If you, if you do have issues with, um, with MySQL in a production OpenStack deployment, please do either email me or email uh, the OpenStack operators or development mailing list and um, we can certainly help you out. So. Okay, thank you for your time. Yes, thank you. This is it. And now I give it to Elisa because uh, we will have an OpenStack Live conference in Santa Clara and she wanted to say a few words about it. Hi guys, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so we are, uh, this is our inaugural, inaugural event, it's OpenStack Live Conference and Expo. It's running in parallel to the Bricona Live MySQL Conference and Expo. It's going to be in Santa Clara, April 13th through the 14th. And if you're interested in attending, we have early bird rates that are available now. And the link is here in, in the deck. And when you get a copy, you can go ahead and take a look. Um, we just provided a sneak peek of some of the selected talks. And Peter, um, you'll be presenting an update to this presentation, I believe. Um, you, you, uh, that was accepted. Yes. Yes, yeah, so yes. we can look forward to that. And then also, I would like to let you know that um, one of the um, registration, one, one of you will receive a free pass to this conference and I'll work on determining the winner after, um, after today's event and let you, let you know. So that, that's a pleasant prize. Um, so that's what I had to say about that. Um, so with that said, I'd like to turn the floor over to questions and answers. If you have any questions, um, please go ahead and type them into the questions panel within uh, the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, let's see here. Uh, there are no current questions, so let's just wait a, wait a couple seconds and see what comes up. You guys must have done a great job. And uh, nothing yet. So you have any um, closing thoughts besides what you've already provided or anything you'd like to share? While we wait a couple of minutes for people to type things in. So one of the things that uh, isn't particularly uh, related to our findings in uh, this particular study um, is how to structure your um, Galera clusters appropriately for um, a multi-region uh, data center or multi-data center setup uh, for OpenStack. So if any of you are out there running 
um, OpenStack deployments uh, across multiple data centers, you've undoubtedly run into a decision point where you're trying to decide, well, how do I um, share my Keystone identity database uh, across regions? Uh, what, what do I keep within a region? Um, and, and all that kind of stuff. And one piece of advice I, I have is to uh, think of the failure domains for different availability zones within OpenStack as how you structure your Galera clusters. And by that I mean put Nova, Neutron, Cinder um, all within a single Galera cluster inside one availability zone or region and uh, house your Keystone and Glance image registry databases in a separate cluster that is shared across regions. And one thing that uh, when I was originally setting up our cross-region database cluster uh, at AT&T was I was quite concerned about WAN replication latency. Um, and I thought, well, you know, because because we're going over a WAN, then we really don't want to use a synchronous replication system like Galera Cluster. Um, and after talking to a number of folks online, um, I, I was encouraged to just try it out. And um, it, it works surprisingly well. Um, not, only does, uh, not only is WAN replicated synchronous uh, database replication with Galera stable, but um, the, the performance is quite amazing, even over high latency WAN links. So uh, you don't want to put uh, databases that have extremely high write rates uh, into, um, into a Galera cluster. You want to use something different for that, whether it's standard MySQL master slave or MongoDB or something, something else that can handle a uh, huge write volume. But for identity data, image registry data, and metadata, um, uh, it's, it really is a perfect tool. Um, so just wanted to, to mention that. There's a, a follow-up comment to, you, to what you just said. And um, it is cross-DC Keystone MySQL replication has worked pretty well for us, although we don't encourage cross-site token use. Right. So that's a, that's a really good point. So. Um, Within Keystone, there are uh, a, a few sets of data. One is the identity data for user information, that kind of thing. Um, many people use the SQL backend for that. Some people use the LDAP backend, so on and so forth. Um, there's also a separate storage driver for uh, authentication tokens. And that is one thing I, that is extremely high write volume. Uh, even for a, a relatively small number of users that are actively using the, the OpenStax API services, each of those requests is, is going to generate uh, a, a request into the Keystone token table to do authentication information. So what we would do is uh, replicate over the WAN in a Galera cluster the identity and assignment information, so roles and that kind of thing, um, but we would have the memcache driver set up for handling tokens in each region. Now the drawback of that is that you don't have cross-region tokens, which means you have to run either a dashboard or uh, on a, a, a token authentication within each region, and uh, you, you can't say have a, a, a single centralized dashboard that can uh, manage VMs across all, your, all of your regions. Um, but the the price you pay in, in in performance of using the SQL token driver and sending all of that that to those token rights over a WAN replicated link is is quite high, and that's why we chose to to uh, go with the second option, which was use the memcache driver for tokens and run a Keystone endpoint within each region and just share the identity data. Right, and the person who posted that comment would like to share that they are from Time Warner Cable, so it's a pretty serious usage. Well, hello from Time Warner Cable. Um, <laughs> glad, glad you uh, have run into that, that exact same thing. Uh, I'm curious, uh, it, well, uh, Elisa, are there any other questions? Um, um, not, not yet, no. 
So uh, I'll just go ahead and, and uh, ask that, that commenter a question, uh, whether they replicate the Glance image registry database. And that is, that is something that uh, provides a, a really nice benefit if you do that, is that if you back your Glance image uh, service with uh, object storage that's distributed, say uh, using Swift or Ceph or, or anything else, um, and you replicate the image registry data, that means that uh, a person can snapshot a VM in one region and, it, uh, and the snapshot record will immediately show up in every other region and allow them to launch that snapshot in any other region. So this is something that you, know, you, that you kind of have to jump through a number of hoops to do with something like AWS or, or any service that doesn't or any OpenStack deployment that doesn't actually uh, share its Glance image registry database, um, and something that we we used effectively at AT&T to to um, to allow our tenants to snapshot in one region and launch in another one seamlessly. Uh, the person from Time Warner Cable said that we do back Glance to Swift, but do not currently replicate the registry. We are planning on doing that for DR purposes. Awesome. Um, that that that's good to hear. Uh, not just for DR, but also just uh, to make your uh, your users happy, <laughs> so they can they can snapshot and launch in whatever region they want. Okay, so um, there is a question: um, Have you tested on Maria DB Galera cluster at all? I have not. No, um, that's certainly something that we can we can look into putting a variant into our Ansible playbooks. Though it shouldn't be shouldn't be difficult at all. Okay. No, it, uh, it shouldn't be. Okay, great. Any other questions, audience? I think that pretty much wraps it up, guys. Thank you for a very great presentation today. Um, and well, thank, thank you guys for having me on. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Come back again, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you at OpenStack Live. And audience, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, and I hope that you have a rest your rest of your day is great. Thank you so much for attending.